Hello, hello, everyone. My name is Erica. Welcome, welcome to the Nomadic Network. Uh, feel free to turn on your cameras if you can. I would love to just do a little announcement while everyone's filing in. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly. Let me see if I can do this easily. Can everyone see? Yep. Okay, perfect. So I'm Erica. Um, welcome to the Nomadic Network. Uh, this is a little bit about TNO. Ooh, sorry. I do not want that to play. <laughs> One second. Hopefully it just stops there. Okay. So uh, I'm Erica and I help Nomadic Matt run the Nomadic Network. Um, this was a, this is a network that was founded by Nomadic Matt back in 2019. We've hosted, I think over 300, 300 virtual events at this point. And we are also back to hosting in-person events. We have a fairly new website. So if you, if this is your first time, I really recommend going and checking out the nomadicnetwork.com, creating a profile on there. By the way, as you're listening to me, if you could find the chat and say where you're calling in from, what number event this is for you, and uh, just let's say your favorite country in the world, just as a little icebreaker in the chat, that would be wonderful. Um, and so let me go on. Hi, everyone. This is the network. And here are a few ways you could get involved with TNN. We have Instagram, TikTok. We have lots of virtual and in-person events. We also have group tours and uh, you can become a chapter leader in your city that can all be found on the nomadicnetwork.com. And a few quick reminders um, for those of you who haven't been to any of our virtual events or virtual book clubs before. We love it when you turn your camera on. We really want this to feel like a uh, community book club, like in a library. Obviously, we're in all different parts of the world right now. So this is as good as we get if you could turn your camera on. We ask that you stay muted and use the chat for questions. If you could type the word question in the front, it will be easier for me to pick out and then call on you in the ending part of this where we're going to do a community q and I would love to be able to um, ask you to unmute yourself and just ask Karen, the author, your question directly to her. That's how we like to run these events. So if that's possible and in your, you're in an area where you could do that, great. If not, I can just read your question directly from the chat. Um, and then also, we love for you to follow our speakers and support them, our authors. So Karen is doing this out of the kindness of her heart and her passion for sharing her knowledge with you. So we really appreciate Karen for being here. And just, you know, we're here to learn, satiate your wanderlust and have fun. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Karen. Thank you so much for being here. And before I forget, I'm sorry, I did not introduce a very special person today. Jill is helping me with this book club. So she will be running the Q&A section. Jill, can you wave a little bit? or say hi. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Now I'd like to pass it off to Karen to give her to let her introduce herself to everyone here. All right. It we again. can't hear you. Okay. Yeah, it keeps <laughs> muting me. I didn't touch it, I swear. Anyhow, hi, everybody. It is lovely that you have all come and from and I see from all over the place. So that's very exciting. Um, I am here because I am a true travel fanatic and I started very young. Um, I left home when I was 17 and moved to Europe by myself, ended up staying there for three years, became absolutely passionate about traveling. And then when I went, came back to the US and went to college, I went off to Japan on my own, well, with a friend. And we were there, I was a ceramic student and we went there and went to, studios all over Japan, speaking not a word of Japanese. And that had two really wonderful <laughs> uh, things that it did for me. One is it made me totally brave that I could go anywhere on the globe, whether I spoke the language or I didn't, and get around, which was a good thing to learn. And then the second piece of it um, 
was that I thought, well, I don't have to learn another language. I managed to get around Japan without reading or speaking it. So I never learned another language, which was unfortunate. I wish I had. Um, the other piece of it is, is that my mother always wanted to travel and, and really couldn't for a lot of reasons, but she encouraged me to travel. I was, I was her surrogate out in the world. And she encouraged me to keep a travel journal. And I have one from when I was nine years old and we went to Florida. And I have been keeping them ever since. People sometimes when they read my books go, how do you know all of these details? How do you remember all of this? Well, when you take thousands of photographs and every single day you write in a journal, you'd be surprised how well you can remember things. And I started writing stories just because it felt like a great thing to do. And I was in a writing group and I took writing classes and people kept saying, these are fabulous. You have to put a book together. But I was working. And so I, you know, kind of kept putting it off and just kept writing them. And then when I retired, it was like, okay, now is the time. And I did put it together, found a publisher and got my first book out there. And my goal with the book, apart from just writing the stories was, I really want to encourage people to get out of their comfort zone and go see the world. That was truly what I wanted from this. And the best compliment I have ever received was a woman who I did not know at all wrote to me and said, I love your book. I bought 12 of them. I bought 12 of them and sent them off to my friends as holiday presents. And as a result, three of them bought tickets and are now traveling. And I thought, oh my God, it has been a success. And I genuinely, that was possibly the best, the best compliment I've ever gotten. And it encouraged me um, to keep writing. And I have a second book that's coming out in October. And from suggestions that people made to me, they said, we love your stories about people. Um, some of the people that you've met and you talk about are fascinating. Do you have more stories? Um, some of the places are just incredible. And so I thought, okay, well, what really odd places have I been to? And I started thinking about it, realizing I had a lot of them. Um, one of the stories in the new book is about going in a four-seater plane to the outback of Australia to an opal mining town that had 30 people where they live underground because during the summer, it gets to like 140 degrees. So it's much cooler underground. And then they said to me, yeah, you know, if you look around, you'll see all these piles of slag. And the reason that they have so much slag is that they, when they decide they wanna do some more opal mining, they just create another room because the government won't stop them for that. They're expanding their house, but what they're really doing is mining for opals. Anyhow, it was, it was fascinating. I, I just absolutely loved it. And, um, and then the final piece was people love food stories, really love food stories. And I had written a couple of them in the first book, but of course I have a lot of them. You travel enough, it is impossible not to have great food stories. And I included some of the best things and some of the worst things that have ever happened. And I don't know how much you want me to go on, but if I can keep going, I'll tell you the best and the worst real quickly. The best was my grandmother was possibly the worst cook on the globe. And she used to make something that she called strudel. And her strudel was dough that when it came out of the oven was like rubber. And she had put apricot jam on it, which oozed out and burned. The stuff was inedible. And after about uh, two, three hours, it became rock hard and you could break a tooth on it. Then I went to Austria and walked into the Cafe Mozart, which is renowned for having fabulous desserts. And the waiter suggested that I have the apple strudel. And I'm thinking to myself, oh God, no, that stuff's just awful. So now <laughs> I tasted it and it was revelatory. It was like, oh, this is what strudel is. Now I get why people like it. And truly, I had not known. The reverse of that one was I was in Tanzania. And one night we'd come back one evening from a, a, a um, 
uh, just meandering around the uh, Niangorogoro crater to see the animals. And we hear a shriek. Okay, what, what is the shriek? Well, it was the tour leader and we all come running out. He says, no, no, it's all right. Go back. It's fine. It's fine. You know, we'll, we'll have dinner in five minutes. Well, we came out and he said, okay, this is a chance for you to prove how brave and daring you all are. Oh, yeah. He said, well, the cook didn't quite understand what I meant. We were going to have a special treat tonight. We were going to have dessert. But he doesn't understand because it's not in their culture to understand the idea of you know, a big, an appetizer, an entree, and a dessert. So what we got was this enormous bowl filled with things like Vienna sausages and carrots and potatoes. And on top of that, you had put cling peaches, poured the sauce, the syrup from it all over, and then decorated the whole thing with sardines and very carefully put the sardines so they look very pretty, and then took the sardine oil and poured that on top. Oh, and there was a can of evaporated milk, sweetened evaporated milk in there as well. And we all looked at this and went, oh, God. Anyhow, but if we hadn't eaten that, there was no other food. So we're sitting there laughing hysterically and pulling out single pieces to eat and cleaning them off. And I can say with absolute certainty that was the worst dinner I've ever had in my life. So with that... I can keep talking. I can talk forever about stories. So, but I think Jill wants to ask me questions. Well, I have to say, I think you answered half of them, but um, <laughs> I'll throw I'll throw some at you. Um, um, one of the first things that you talk about was um, traveling. And I think you called it mismatched um, travel partners when you were talking about was it was it Ron in the London trip oh, yeah. going oh, along yeah. with you? And I thought to myself. Right off the bat, there's a lot written about solo travel and how to and but there isn't a lot written about how to get along with a travel partner that maybe is a mismatch. And I wondered if you had some more stories about that or if you could offer advice about vetting your travel partners. Well, I've been thrown into situations. That one was one where I I semi chose him to come along and it was truly a disaster. He was scared <laughs> of everything. And the fr there were three of us. And the other woman and I were very brave and wanted to just go off and do everything. And he was literally terrified. I don't think he'd ever been out of Britain before. The British guy. Uh, but I've also been thrown into situations. I was, and I write about it in the first book about being in the Galapagos Islands on a boat with people that I detested everybody else except the friend I had traveled with. And here we are stuck on this boat for 12 days with people that we could not stand. And we were figuring out strategies how to avoid them, but you couldn't because we all ate dinner together, breakfast together. And so it became a, okay, I just have to meditate and enjoy what I can enjoy and just not respond to all the things that were going on around me because it was so awful. There was a guy with his daughter who was in her teens, did not want to be there and made it very clear the whole time. The father was thought the rest of us were his slaves, like, go get me this and go do that. And you know, he was the only guy who was traveling with only six of us. And then there were two women who immediately hated my travel partner. And it became this war of wills between them. And, and it took, a you can't always do anything about it. When I can, I just walk away and do things on my own as much as I possibly can. And I do travel solo, but I also travel with friends. And I have to say there are some, you know, I have great travel companions, some of which I notice are here. Um, they, they've come on to support me, so. Um, but you know, I have great people to travel with and, and you, you just, you live with it or you ditch them if you can, if you really have a problem. Um, what do you do to prepare for a trip? And I'm wondering if you read books about the location you're visiting and it how you research it. And... Yeah. Um, I do a lot of, of just online Googling of things. Mm -hmm. Um, and I often look for novels about the place and I love reading novels 
about the place that I'm going to. I think that's just great fun. Um, guidebooks are less interesting to me because I'd rather find things on my own. And I have mm. a few things that, that I always say to people who are potential travelers, particularly for people who are a little bit nervous about it, find something you absolutely love and go do that. So if you're into sports, go to a sports event in a country. You know, you may not even know what the sport is. Um, I happen to love theater and music and dance. Well, particularly for music and dance, there are lots of opportunities and you will meet like-minded people. And so that's one of the things, you know, and that's not gonna be in the guidebooks. It's never in the guidebooks. So I, you know, find local newspapers online and figure out what's going on in an area. And that's what I go do. Um, yeah, I go see, you know, a lot of places I've been to many times, but I will go to, um, you know, the, the must sees and I never do more than one a day because you know what? I don't want to be running around for this. I want to experience people. I get on public transportation and just go and randomly get off at a stop and walk around um, because it's, and I've come to incredible things, absolutely come to incredible things by just, um, I was with <laughs> my friend Judy, who's on the call and we were in Berlin and we just decided to take a tram. And when we got off at the end of it, we found ourselves in a brand new at the time um, museum about the, the wall and how it came down and what happened. And it was not in any of the guidebooks because it had just opened. And if we hadn't taken this tram and gotten off, we would never would have found it. It was fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of things like that. It's, you know, it's like do, do what other people are not doing because that's how you're going to really understand what a place is like. And meet I'm, locals. I'd, I'd like to ask you about the process of um, getting your book um, published. And um, you already mentioned that you journaled and took photographs. And I, I, I wondered the whole time if you had to dig deep to come up with these stories or if the, if the, if the stories you really want to tell just pop back into your memory. And then also, if you could talk about how you went about finding a publisher and, and working out your, your um, presentation. Yep. I um, have a very easy time writing. I have so many stories I can't even begin. Okay. I will never run out of stories because I'm constantly traveling. I mean, I'm leaving next Friday for South America. Um, but because I have all these journals, because I quite literally have tens of thousands of photos, it's really easy. And, you know, somebody brings up a subject and I have a story. Anybody who travels as much as I have, you know, and the, the quote for my next book is, um, uh, I gotta get the quote right, but it's travel makes you interested and then it makes you a storyteller. And it does because you can't help but have stories if you've traveled. And it was just a question. I, I have lists of stories to tell and I haven't even begun to finish them. Every time you know something pops in my head, I put it on the list. And you know, the last book was a, a, just, it was kind of a travel memoir. It was, it's my story told through travel stories. And th the next one is not. And then the one after this is something completely different mm. that I've already started on and thought about. And that's, you know, and, and it's not hard to do. It's, it's, I, it just, it just pops into my head. And I work with a writing, I'm in a writing group, um, have been for a decade. And they're in, it's so helpful mm. in keeping me on track, both in terms of, I write, meet, we meet every two weeks and I will have something every two weeks for them to read because I am determined to get a book out. Um, and, and they are really helpful. Once I had the book clear in my head and I knew what I was doing, I started to think about how I was gonna get published. And everybody in my writing group was encouraging me to do that. And I, I 
thought about going the route of traditional publishing, um, and, but I had done that once before. I had gotten an agent for a different travel book and I had signed a contract with a very well-known literary agency. And then she left and went off and I was assigned to a different um, agent, literary agent, who, as it turned out, hated travel books with a passion. Huh. And it was like, oh, this is useless. And I was still working, so I just gave up. And I thought, I can't go through that again. And then I was told about an independent publisher who accepts manuscripts, reads them, and decides if they want to accept them or not. And my understanding is, at the time the first book came out, it was, they were, I think they were reading about 50 for every book that they accepted. Mm -hmm. Now it's a whole lot more than that because they're, they've since won Indie Publisher of the Year three times from the American Book Association. So, but, it, but I decided to do that. And it was, that was the best decision I could have made because it was a, a very easy process. Once you get the book accepted, um, it's, you know, they, they take you through it and it's, it's a very supportive place to get published. And the second time, you know, I was encouraged, well, go for a traditional publisher. And I said, I don't want to do it. You know, I want to write. I love writing. I hate all the other pieces. I, you know, I like promoting, but I really don't like the whole process of going through an agent and, and going through, you know, 8 million iterations and adapting it to what people want. And I just said, no, it's my book, my stories. I want it out there. But I also didn't want to self-publish. And I was clear about that. So this was a good middle way to do it. And it's She, write, she Writes Press. Erica just put it up there. And they're terrific. Um, this is a question that I'm beginning to struggle with. but um, um, And it relates to the recent emphasis on um, your carbon footprints and um, climate change and, and flying has just become almost evil. And I know you said you travel, you take like 30 to 40 flights a year. Um, how do you, how do you think about that? Well, I took 30 to 40 flights a year when I was traveling for business as well as personal. Uh -huh. um, I'm not traveling for business anymore. So the number has gone down and I try not to take short trips if I can avoid it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going with a, a real reason and I'm going for a chunk of time. I used mm -hmm. to take these trips where I'd go for two days, turn around and come back and mm -hmm. talk about, you know, but that was also pre-Zoom and pre, you know, all the things that we can do now. If I can do things without going to a place, that's great. Mm -hmm. But travel requires you're getting somewhere and it's either in a car, on a plane, whatever. And, um, I've just accepted that that's what it's going to be. And I do everything else I can, uh, you know, in terms of recycling and not, you know, and not wasting things. And I'm pretty careful about that. In fact, I would say I'm very careful about that. Um, but this is such a passion of mine. I'm not willing to give it up. And, and I think it, the value of it, particularly as I'm writing and getting it out to many, many people, who are then learning about the world in a very different way. And I think learning about the world makes you think differently about conflicts that are going on in the world and, and disagreements in the world. And you learn to separate the citizens from the government because they are two very different things. And I have never been anywhere on the globe where the people were not uniformly generous, um, happy to meet you, helpful, and in every possible way, people that I would want to know. And, well, that's a book. <laughs> yeah. That's a book. Yeah, but it's true. It's, it is a separation. You have to say the government is one thing, the people are very, very different. And somebody just asked the question, I said, who takes care of my pooch when I'm gone? You've probably seen him running around back there. Um, he... Um, I have a, a dog sitter who comes in and stays, and he loves my dog, and my dog loves him. So, exactly. 
he's not running around. He's laying on the um, couch. Sofa behind me, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm allowed to ask this question because I think I'm about your age. Um, how have you, in the decades that you've been traveling, how have you seen travel change? Um, not oh. just physically, but also kind of uh, spiritually. Absolutely. Well, on the practical side of it, when I first started traveling for business, and I was in my 30s and was traveling internationally for business and always traveling either business or first class. Trust me, I was the only woman in business or first mm -hmm. class unless there was a spouse. Mm -hmm. And I got treated in a way that I wouldn't ever treat anyone else. That has changed enormous. Um, they now accept that women are in fact equal and entitled to the same treatment as males. And that to me is a big plus. Um, I also find that there are more people traveling from all over the world. When I first started traveling, you rarely saw people from big groups of people, except maybe from Japan, but you didn't see a lot of Asians. You certainly didn't see a lot of South Americans or Africans traveling, um, which is now one of the reasons for the carbon footprint problem is that everybody is traveling. And now that um, COVID is on the back burner, shall we say, it's not gone, um, it is, it's a real issue because the crowds in certain places have gotten unbearable. There are places I will not go back to ever because even in the off season, because there is no off season for certain places, the crowds are overwhelming. And I think they have made it a very different experience from what it was. When I first started traveling, you, when, I, when I was in Europe, you could look at people and I would know from their shoes for sure, but how they were dressed, I could tell you immediately what nationality they were. Now, everyone around the globe dresses the same way, wears the same sneakers, carries the same iPads. You couldn't tell by looking at people where they came from. And that is really a surprise um, for somebody who is never used to seeing that. You know, you walk into, I remember walking into a store years ago in um, Singapore, I think it was, and I needed some kind of office supply because I was working. And I said to the concierge, you know, I need to get such and such. Where can I get it? And he said, oh, well, if you go into the mall down there, there is a, um, oh God, I can't think of the store, but it's, they have a blue light special. Um, what's the store? Kmart. K Kmart. Kmart. And he said, the Kmart will have it. And I walked in and sure enough, they were having a blue light special. I'm going, oh my God, I'm halfway around the world. <laughs> And uh, there's a blue light special. This is, this is, you know, uh. Uh, and so globalization has in some ways really taken over the personalities of places. You have to look hard and you have to go off the beaten track more. And I find that I have less and less interest of doing, even if it's a place I've never been to before, of doing the tourist things. Hmm. That's that, I would, that I would rather just go explore on my own and get a sense of the people, the culture, the food without going to a guidebook. And yeah, maybe I won't have the best meals in the world, but you know what? I'll have meals where the locals are eating. And to me, that's a, that's a huge plus. I, I had um, two other questions. Um, one was, um, and, it, and it kind of hit me and made me stop reading for a minute. When you talk, I, you were in, um, I think you were in Rio, but you had you had been in Sao pa Paulo and talked about becoming a fatalist about travel disasters. And I wondered if you could expand on that a little bit. Um, it, well, I have had a, several times where, and I'm not going to use that, that as an example. I'm going to use a different one. I was in Alaska, which is also in the book, and I went to um, Denali went into the park and I never saw the mountain. I was with another woman and we, we just never saw the mountain. And we were on our way out and um, 
well, maybe we'll see the mountain, maybe we won't. There were two buses left going back to the campground. Okay, well, let's just take the first one. We're never gonna see it. And we gave up, took the first bus. And as we are just about getting to the campground, we see ambulances, police cars screaming into the park. We found out later that the, that the, the bus behind us had pulled over to see some bears. The road had given out and the bus went down the side of a cliff. And about half the people on the bus died <clears throat> and the other half were seriously injured and had to be medevaced to a hospital. And I thought, I could have so easily been on that bus. And then I thought, yeah, but things happen in New York, which is where I live. Something could happen here too. And I had, I've had that kind of thing. I was in Moscow and taking the subway every single day. And the station that I took that was closest to my hotel, the day after I left, it was at the time of all the Chechen problems, was bombed. And it was that station could easily have been there. And you just get to the point where you go, okay, I could be home and have a disaster. I could be on the road and have a disaster. You know what? I'd rather be on the road. Something's gonna happen. You know, and I've, I've been injured a couple of times and had to have medical care. You know what? I've had injuries at home. It's gonna happen. And you wanna be a fatalist? That's my fatalism is, if something's going to happen, it can happen anywhere. So I might as well be doing what I'd love to. And then my last question was, um, so because this is something I have trouble wrapping around. Do you, um, so were you born without even a sliver of a homebody gene? And do you ever have a sense of kind of wanting to be at home and contributing to your, your hometown, which. Uh, oh, but I do. Way? Oh, but I do. I love being home. I love my home. I love my dog. Um, I volunteer for a group called SCORE. I'll give them a plug here, who is a national organization that mentors entrepreneurs. And I do a lot of that. And I give webinars for them and, and workshops. And um, there are many, many things that I do now that I'm retired and have the time to do. And I've always volunteered and I've always worked pro bono for all kinds of organizations because I do care. And um, yeah, it's, um, I, I love both and I do love being home. It's not, um, you know, it is not something that I would ever give up. I know people who are true nomads and never come home and don't have a home. I couldn't do that. I have to have a home to come to. That's great to hear because I, I didn't sense that, you know, oh, you don't get it. That's one thing you don't get a sense of from your, your book. It, um, and I questioned it for you and for myself. Thank you. I'm, I'm questioned out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take over. Thank you so much, Jill. And it was just really nice to hear the back and forth. I love, um, I would love these book clubs because I feel like whenever I read a book or watch a TV show or a movie or something like that, I never think, wow, maybe one day I'll get to ask the creator of this a question. And I think that's, this is like the best part of um, the, the internet and what we're able to do here. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So we're all over. I mean, I know I know that Karen's over here in New York, Jill's in Boston, I'm in West Africa, like, and we're just chit-chatting and everyone else is sitting wherever they are. So I would love to open this up, but before they, before I do, I'd just like to ask you, um, what is on your short list for countries that you still want to go to that you haven't been before? Okay. Where you are is number one on my list. As it happens, I desperately want to go to Ghana. My brother used to go there all the time, has told me wonderful stories about it. And it is absolute top of my list. Um, Come on over. <laughs> right. But it is it literally, and, and people who know me know that that's very high on my list. Um, I've never been to Malta. Love to go to Malta. Um, I want to go to... Um, been in Borneo. Why am I missing the name of the other island? But anyhow, the South Pacific. There's a number of islands there. 
I was going to do that for my 70th birthday. And then there was COVID. And so that did not happen, but it is still very high on my list of places that I want to go. Um, I don't want to go to the really, I'm not interested in Tahiti particularly, but I'd like to go to the Cook Islands and some of the more remote islands that have very unique cultures. So that's, that's pretty high on my list. And <clears throat> this next trip, going back to a city I love, which is Rio, Rio is Buenos Aires. And, and I see my friend laughing because she's going with me and she's going, yeah, 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 we're not going to Rio. Because I keep saying that, Buenos Aires. And then we're going down the coast and we're going to Antarctica. And so I'm really excited about that. Well, I feel like we should just let that. Jill say where she just came back from three days ago. <laughs> ah, I see the penguins. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And that's so, what I did, Buenos Aires, Ushuaia, and the Antarctica. Yep, you got it. That's it. Par that's, that's Karen, the one. you have not been to Antarctica yet, but your book has gone to Antarctica. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's exciting. Wow. Well, good for you guys. On to Antarctica. Is that Sue? Is that also who's going? I'm yes. seeing reactions. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, congrats you and Sue, Sue for is going my to travel Antarctica, companion. Sue on many, many trips. Oh, that's so sweet. That gives me hope. I have one travel companion that I've gone to like 10 countries with and I hope she keeps yeah. traveling with yeah, me all over here, the world. <laughs> somewhere here I saw Judy and Judy is another travel companion who I go all over the place with. So we are going to, when I come back in March, we're going to Crystal Bridges in, in Arkansas because I've wanted to see that for a long time. That is the um, Walmart money has made created a museum and i've seen the architecture photos of it and i want to see it in person it's supposed to have a good collection and then we're going to go to eureka springs which i've also been to but it's a great town so and judy's never oh. been there so i'm gonna how go take sweet. off for a while yeah how sweet okay so let's get them dive into some of these questions um let's see kathleen has a question Kathleen, would you like to unmute yourself and Hi. ask it? Okay. <laughs> Here I am. Hi there. Um, we're all getting older. Do you find it difficult as you age, Karen, um, getting the um, energy up and not think about the aches and pains before you take these, you know, long trips. Arkansas probably isn't going to be that difficult. No. But when you're on a plane for hours and hours and... Well, I will give you one little secret here. I have bad back. And in fact, I'm about to have back surgery. So I know about pain. And you know what? I refuse. I just mentally refuse to let it stop me. And yeah... It's, there are times when I have to just slow down, but instead of going to my hotel, my hotel room, I'll go sit in a cafe and watch people. I try, I don't do things, as I said before, I, you know, I'm not going to see every single thing when I go somewhere um, because I want to really see, get the culture. And you don't do that by running around. You do that by getting quiet and sitting and watching and experiencing, getting into conversations with people and you pace yourself and don't feel like you have to do everything. Because I think that is something that, that people who travel sort of have this mindset of, I must see and experience it all. And my, my mindset is very different than that. And I think that helps. I agree with you. What, what about the airplane trips? You know, so will you will you spend the extra money to go business class or first no. class? No, because the only way that's comfortable for me is to sit totally straight up. The minute oh. I lean back, I'm in <laughs> agony. So sitting straight, I'm the only person on any airplane that never puts their seat back and loves that they're straight <laughs> up and down because it's so comfortable. Oh, good for you. Yeah. Um, I do you understand that, that it's that if it's not comfortable for you, you might spring for a better seat, but in my case, love it. Okay. And do you ever take people with you? You know, you talk about traveling with friends, but um, I'm actually a friend of yours on Facebook. I forget uh, how I found you, maybe through uh, a woman's group. 
whatever, do you ever, you know, I love going by myself to places. Yeah, I travel with friends. I have taken every one of my nieces and nephews on a trip. Um, I've already told my grand nieces and nephews that they will be going on a trip when they get to 18. And of course, when I told this to one of my nephews, who's a smart aleck, I said, yeah, I'll take you anywhere you wanna go. And his answer was, oh good, let's go to North Korea. And it was like, oh, come on, you know, anywhere that's legal and safe. Oh, well, we didn't say that. But yes, I do. I take, I take, you know, I, I take kids because I think it, it, showing them the world is one of the best things you can do. And, um, and friends, I, absolutely. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Happy, happy travels. And, ha and happy travels to you. I would love to invite Max to ask one of his questions about synchronicity and also plug an event that we're having about going to unconventional destinations since you mentioned North Korea. It's coming up in the next, uh, I think next month. So I'll drop that link in too. Okay. Max, can you unmute yourself? And I'm gonna mute myself yeah. for one second sure. because I'm going to blow my nose. <laughs> Um, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. Um, it's six o'clock in the morning here in New Zealand, and it's not raining. It's practically rained every day this whole year down here. And if you've seen the news in Auckland, you can see how much water we've actually had. Um, I was lucky that I've wandered this world a few times when I was young. And us travellers come up with this term about synchronicity, something that's more than just luck. And I'm interested in examples of that you may have where things that happened, like the examples that you gave about the uh, tube station and that, where it's more than luck. And how do you explain that? Well, I can tell you I've had it happen endless numbers of times where I sit down and I start talking to someone and I know nothing about them because I, I will chat with anyone. And, I, and here's another little piece that you don't know about me was that when I started my career, I was a market researcher. So I got really good at asking questions and I used to run focus groups and interview people. So I am willing to talk to anyone anytime about anything. And as a result of that, I, I get into conversations constantly people. And they will tell me things that blow me away about, you have to go here, you have to go there. Let me bring you here. Let me do this. Oh, we, I, I met someone in Indonesia and it turned out she was from Britain and we knew a bunch of the same people. Now, why in Indonesia should I meet this woman? She was in my profession, and, but in England, and we knew a bunch of the same people. I have no, I cannot explain it to you. I can only tell you that it does happen. I wish I had an answer for that one. But, you know, it's like, if you do it enough, it, things are going to happen that you truly cannot explain. But it happens all the time. I wish I had an answer for you. If anybody else does, I'd love to hear it. I like Max's other question also. About yeah, go for it. Go for it, Max. Hang on. Hang on. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm lying in bed here trying to uh, read sideways and type sideways. So <laughs> every time you touch the uh, return button, it, it enters it. So you could be halfway through a sentence and it disappears. Um, this I've asked before to some um, presenters on the network here and to other close friends who have traveled extensively as well. Are there experiences that you feel should not be written, but you need to keep them purely to be spoken and especially spoken to a live present audience? So like doing a presentation to a live audience. Twofold, one is that it gives you opportunity to check with that audience that they actually understand the setting. Because if they don't understand the setting, they won't get the punchline. They won't actually understand what happened. The other side of it is it, or is it, that you just want to keep control of that story because it's so unique, 
It's so special to you that if you do put it into print, you lose control of that. An example I have for myself, to give an example of this, is I had a unique experience of being able to sleep on top of the Great Pyramids of Giza. And the ghosts of the pharaohs rose that night. And I say as a statement, a story that has to be spoken, not written. And this is before I ended up um, setting out to walk the length of Africa. But um, you've been lucky to have traveled extensively as well. Are there experiences that you just feel should not be written and only spoken? I would say no. And if you had asked me this 10 years ago, I would have said yes. And it is the people in my writing group who have said to me, you have a good story, you need to write it. And there are some things that I thought were extremely personal and they were extremely difficult to write. There's, I, I write in this book about the deaths of both of my parents in very different circumstances. And I had very different relationships with them. And I, didn't, I wrote the stories because I wanted to write them and I, I was not going to include them in the book. And then I was told by the people in my writing group, you must include them. They are so, they are such telling stories. They are so interesting that you've got to, you've got to get past feeling like you can't share them because that's what interests people. People want to know um, something that really tells them about who you are, what your experiences have been, and how you've responded to them. And it was at the beginning, the writing that I did was so different from the writing that I do now because I was much more circumspect about things because I didn't want to give too much away. And the more I wrote, the more I understood that when I do, when I am writing from the heart and authentically and writing about experiences that sometimes were difficult, um, that that's the thing that people most connect with. And so I've become willing to write not everything, but pretty much everything. Brings more humanness to it. I can see yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. A little like, I I feel you when somebody's reading that, like I understand I've been there or I've been in a situation like that and it connects you more to the book, the reader, the author, or the author the reader to the author and that's great yeah it's really nice it's you know what people try to do with social media they try to share so that they're more authentic it's like share the stories so that you come off as you know well well and it's also share the stories in a way that's really speaking the truth right and, and I find that some I mean the chapter about my father if I tell you I rewrote it 20 times that's not an exaggeration and because it was just a very difficult thing for me to write. And when I finally got it and the people in my writing group say, you have it, I get it. Um, it was such a relief. It was like, okay, I can tell that story now. And you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how else to say it, but sometimes it's the really difficult stories that A, challenge me as a writer and challenge me as a person. And it makes it, it makes it something that I have to do. So, I, so really, there are not too many stories I wouldn't tell. Would you equate travel stories like your book to memoirs? Oh, yeah. Travel stories equal memoir. Okay. In, in the first book, yes. The book that's currently out there, yes. The second book is less so. And the third book will not be at all. Okay. So... Well, why don't we let you tell you tell everyone about your second book then? Since okay. <laughs> that seems like a good segue. <laughs> yeah, there you go. The second book, which is going to be published October third, um, is called Wanderlust: Extraordinary People, Quirky Places, and Curious Cuisine. And people had said to me, "We love the stories about the people you meet. You know, write some more stories about people." Okay, I could do that. I'd met some uh, unbelievable people who have changed the way I think about travel and the way I travel. Um, quirky place, as I said before, going to Australia and going to this you know town with 30 people. 
And there are lots more very quirky places that very few people have ever been to. And food, who doesn't love reading about food? And so I included stories about food. So it's really, it really focuses on people, places, and food. And yes, they're my stories, but they are much less memoir-like than the first book was. Um, and I can also tell you that the third book, I'm interviewing a lot of people because I want to get other people's stories about a particular subject, which I'm not going to talk about, but it is a specific aspect of travel. So that one is in process as, as we speak. I've started interviewing people and heard some phenomenal stories. Intriguing, very intriguing. <laughs> yes, my favorite one is friends of mine who um, are older than I am and they went to Costa Rica and decided, somebody convinced them to go zip line. And yeah. apparently it was a very, very long zip line. And they got to the end of it. And the first thing they said to each other was, okay, we never have to do that one again. And we're glad they had survived. So <laughs> only they told it much better than I just said it because it's, <laughs> it's got lots of what happens before and what happens after. It's pretty funny. Oh, wonderful. I do have a few other questions. I just dropped um, Karen's contact information into the chat. So if you don't get your question or if you don't get to ask your question, I encourage you to connect with Karen and send her, Please do. you know, what, what you think about the book and what your favorite chapter is, but also any of your questions that you have. Um, I know uh, Lee Ann had a question and I thought it was nice to... I think it's nice to share it. Leanne, would you like to unmute yourself? Hi. Um, I hope you can hear me. I'm not really technologically advanced, but I'm um, yes. just enjoying this. I am uh, almost 65, just, uh, I'm, I'm widowed and it's, you know, the empty nest. And I have always dreamed of traveling. I've traveled all over the United States, but I've, I went to Switzerland with my kids once. And I just have the travel bug, but I've never traveled on my own. I, I you know, I, I don't know how to, I, I just bought tickets to go to Chicago to visit my son all by myself. And I've never even gone into a, you know, an airport by myself. I'm always following people. So I just, you know, I, I want to do it. I just need some guidance. Where do I start? How is it better to uh, go with a group first or, uh, you know, I, I don't even know where to begin, but that's all I want to do is travel. Okay. <laughs> so, I uh, my, my suggestion to you is to find a group, but a small group. You do not want to go with 60 people. You will have a poor experience. <laughs> You want to find a group that maybe has six to 12 people, and there are lots of them, and they're less expensive than you'd imagine if you find a good group. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, not that I want to give them a plug, but Road Scholar is a good place to start. But there's a lot of them. And the, the thing that you want to do is pick a place that you've always wanted to go and find a group where you have some time on your own, where you are not being constantly shuttled around by the group. You will meet other people in the group. I, could, I guarantee it. People will be very kind. People who are on groups, you have something in common because you are traveling together and everybody wants to be there to travel. Um, so I would say, yeah, the nomadic network, go with the nomadic network. People want to embrace other travelers and you will find people to eat with and you'll find people to go with but go with a small group, not a big group, and pick somewhere that you've always wanted to go and pick something in wherever it is that you wanted to go that you particularly love. You know, if you're a foodie, find a restaurant that just is gonna be incredible and make it a point to go there. If you love music, um, you know, and it's jazz, find a jazz club. If it's classical, find a concert. You can always find something that, that will connect you to a place that's something that you love 
and it'll make it much easier for you. And it doesn't matter what it is. That's, you know, I'm giving you a couple of examples, but it honestly doesn't matter what it is. And, and that will make you connect with the place. And you'll find that after you've done one or two of those, you're going to feel much more comfortable about traveling by yourself, you know, or grab a friend who's traveled before and, you know, go with them. Right. But, but, you know, definitely go travel. Um, you are not too old. We are <laughs> never too old. Just go do it. And trust me, I'm older than you are. And <laughs> go travel. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm just so excited about starting this new part of my life and, I agree. I'm not too old. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to give up. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely not. Um, and it's fun and you, you'll you have the time of your life, really. And you'll meet people and have great experiences. And then you'll have lots of stories. Absolutely. That's my next step. <laughs> right. And, may, and maybe you'll write a book. <laughs> <laughs> we can only hope. Take notes. Get that <laughs> journal ready. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Leanne. Okay, wonderful. Well, this is the end of the hour. So I just wanted to do some quick closing announcements before we thank Karen for everything that she shared with us today. So bear with me just a second. Let me. Okay, so before we lose everyone, I just wanted to let you know that we have some incredible upcoming events. Oh, it did it again. Um we have some incredible upcoming events. Tomorrow, we have Rolf Potts, the travel author, coming on to talk about his new book. Um, we're reading it 30 pages at a time, and we're discussing it with him. So the first one is tomorrow, same time. And then we have some really cool events, one on travel hacking coming up so you can get free flights around the world, and then some family travel. But we actually have a ton more events. So if you go to the nomadicnetwork.com slash events, that's where you can find it. Um, and then we also have upcoming meetups, find that on the same page. So if you're in one of the cities where we have a chapter, you can meet up with friends and talk about travel over a glass of wine or a hike. Um, all that's also listed on that page. And again, here's Rolf's book club tomorrow. I will actually be running it with him Two book, two book clubs in two days. Very excited about that. And then I know I dropped it in the chat, but we do have tours. They're amazing. I'll be going to Oaxaca on the April one if anyone wants to join me. Um, but we have some to Jordan, Turkey, uh, all over Mexico, actually. We have a lot of tours. Costa Rica, many tours coming up. So if you want to look um, and see if you'd like to join one of those, you can use the code SAVE200 to save $200 off any tour. And thank you so much for joining. Um, I wanted to take a moment and first of all, thank Jill for helping me out today. It was very valuable. And secondly, and lastly, thank you so much, Karen, for joining us, for writing such an awesome book and for sharing it with this group of travel lovers, this travel community. Um, do you have anything well, you'd you. like this, to say before signing this was off? A, this was a wonderful, fun discussion. Loved it. I encourage everyone to get out there and travel. And I hope I'll come back after I write the next, after the, the second book is published. We'll invite you back. Thank you so, so okay. much. Have a wonderful day. And thank you everyone for being here. Same to all Bye. of you. Bye now.